if I may ask everyone to clear the room, we need to start another session in three minutes. If everyone will please take their seats so we can get begin. Excuse me, we have to start our next session. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the next session on hybrid business models. Uh, we have a busy schedule and only 40 minutes, so we need to get started as promptly as possible. <laughs> and so... You're a very nice person. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you are doing very important work as well, so I am running the next session. <laughs> So thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is a, a panel on hybrid business models. The, our goal is to create an interactive session where we take advantage of the knowledge of the speakers we've invited, but as well as the knowledge of the people in the room to start to analyze the kinds of ways we can, track, we can try to n find new solutions to the challenges we all face, which is connecting more people. My name is Christopher Yu. I teach at the University of Pennsylvania, where I lead the One World Connected Project. And we're delighted to have four outstanding standing speakers uh, with us today, uh, one of whom I was going to Good participate. Good morning, everyone. This is Shabani Belu. 
uh, one of whom was going to have to could not make it because of some visa issues and travel issues, but she has prepared a presentation to talk about a rural Indian project they're doing uh, under an organization called Gram Mark. Uh, why don't we start with Sarbani's presentation, and uh, we will, uh, if we can play that now, that would be perfect. From Gramark Rural Broadband Project at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. It's a pleasure to be a part of this panel on uh, hybrid business models, a connectivity approach. Uh, today, I would like to discuss with you the sustainability model uh, that has been developed by Gramark uh, for addressing um, uh, sustainability of connectivity. Um, and uh, this model has not only been developed by Grammar, but it has also um, it is also validated on ground, and it is a working model currently. The development of this model came about uh, with our uh, 25 villages, uh, uh, 25 villages test bed, where we looked into the uh, to, we wanted to experiment the feasibility of unlicensed band 5.8 gigahertz for cost-effective middle mile connectivity and uh, also in the same time also address the sustainability of connectivity by understanding the different um, stakeholders who can take connectivity to the remote areas of uh, India or remote villages of India and uh, the how the connectivity can be uh, sustained uh, and, uh, and how the connectivity uh, can ensure to uh, thrive and grow uh, along with the ut usage and utilization uh, by the people. Uh, so we connected these 25 villages spanning an area of uh, approximately 350 square kilometers and um, and we have uh, uh, so that's that's where we developed the model uh, what is the gram mark sustainable model the when we developed the sustainable model we tried to identify the, the, the we tried to identify who are the important players uh, who can take connectivity to the villages um, uh, villages of India uh, we we found out that uh, one is the private uh, one private entity that can be the private uh, or the, uh, the the the, uh, the telecom operator who can be <coughs> it can be a funding agency also um, the public is the government uh, who sometimes can have infrastructure in the form of buildings towers that are already present in many villages. Um, and uh, policies. So, government has different policies like um, health policies, uh, insurance policies, housing policies, um, uh, schooling, po school, uh, uh, school building policies, schooling policies. Uh, so, different types of policies um, already present with the government and um, uh, the panchayat or the village administration. The, they are the they are in dire need of connectivity, and these are sometimes villages that are that even don't have any voice uh, connectivity as well. So leave, a, leave aside data, they don't even have voice connectivity at all. So what we wanted to do and what we did actually is that we brought uh, these three entities, the public, private and the panchayat in a partnership uh, mode that um, in, in any place, uh, if these three uh, go together in a partnership, then, um, uh, then the the uh, the the best out of each can come about, come come out, and uh, the connectivity can be uh, ensured uh, over in those in the remote villages of India, and it can also be a sustainable uh, sustainable connectivity. Now, what we also identified is that that when connectivity is between a private public uh, partnership, what happens is that the connectivity is usually a top down approach. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in order that for the, uh, uh, but what happens is that the village administration is actually not, or the villages where we are connecting, whom we are connecting, that is actually not taken into account at all uh, for the connectivity. So the, uh, so the, the panchayat or the village administration playing a role in the connectivity is an important thing because uh, that can ensure that the local or the regional needs are given priority over the other needs. Uh, so it has, it is a, it, it, it becomes a bottom up approach. Now what are the main uh, qualities or the main features of this uh, 4P model that we have developed uh, is that it is a multi-stakeholder partnership model as we, I have told you earlier. Um, it, there is an involvement of the local entrepreneur and community. We also found that uh, with interaction uh, from the interaction with the village uh, administration and the villagers that in order to make it sustainable in the villages that uh, there needs to be uh, uh, involvement of the local entrepreneur and the community. Otherwise, the, otherwise it can never be sustained. 
So we have uh, taken that into account in, in this model. We have also, because this was uh, funding, uh, this was uh, mm, uh, this was a project that was funded uh, uh, funded to us. Uh, so we uh, we invested on the capex. That is, we um, uh, we erected the towers, we provided the devices, um, the, all the infrastructure we have provided. So the major part of this model is that we have to recover back the opex. Uh, the um, not we uh, the, uh, the 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 village. Good morning, everyone. Recover back the opex. And that's a key principle in which this model is working. It is also is a community, is a revenue sharing community model because Shabani Belur from Grammarg uh, Rural, uh, one is the private, uh, uh, private entity that can be the private uh, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the telecom operator who can be, <coughs> it can be a funding agency. Until and unless the uh, unless uh, until and unless the revenue there is a revenue generation and sharing mode in this model, the model cannot be sustained. Um, so it is a localized model and can be adapted to regions. It is it is adapt. It, you can we as we have developed in these villages, but we can use uh, it for different villages in India. We uh, we we are we are working on that now currently. And uh, it can be used uh, in uh, various other uh, locations in various parts of the world as well. It is a very modular and scalable model because uh, currently it uh, takes into account 25 villages, but it can uh, it can take into account 50, 100, and so on. Um, so that's that's the modular and scalable uh, scalability of this model. Uh, uh, validation. Uh, so what we did is that after the model has been developed, we have validated it on field in two different scenarios. One is a 15 village scenario, and uh, the other is a 10 village scenario. These 15 villages are. Um, uh, it, it, it has a local ISP led model, where the local ISP takes a bandwidth to the villages, um, and uh, the village administration purchases uh, the two Mbps bandwidth per month. Um, for uh, for uh, uh, roughly around uh, 13 uh, US dollars and uh, then uh, the local ISP uh, makes a revenue out of uh, uh, not only by um, uh, selling the bandwidth to the village office but also selling it to the villagers inside the village. So that is the model of his. And uh, based on the current usage scenario, uh, this is the graph that we, uh, we have uh, that um, the bandwidth uh, required actually is increasing. It's a two-year graph. It's 24 months graph uh, that we have. So uh, the bandwidth, uh, you can see that how the bandwidth requirement increases. And um, because this is two Mbps only, we have just taken the village administration, the village administration's office only, and not uh, actually the. Um, so we uh, we have. We have uh, we have not taken into account uh, that how many access points do does the local ISP put into the into the in the village, so we have not done that. So we have uh, we have just taken two Mbps bandwidth, and we look into the return on investment. So initially it is a uh, it uh, first two months it is uh, negative, but then uh, slowly it catches up, and then you can see that by the mm, by the end of uh, one year. Um, the the local ISP starts making a profit and then again reinvests um, in the uh, into the bandwidth and gets in more bandwidth for the villages and uh, that's how the uh, return on investment increases. We also uh, did a five-year predictive plan uh, model to see that uh, how the bandwidth requirement will increase over time. Um, and um, uh, what will be the bandwidth available, and whether there will be uh, the, whether the, whether the local ISP will have a steady return on investment? And we see that um, uh, from uh, year one towards the end of year one onwards, uh, there is a steady return on investment for the local ISP. Because um, if uh, if the local ISP does not get a steady return on investment, then it becomes very futile for the local ISP to pay, take the bandwidth to the villages uh, and um, uh, provide connectivity to the villages over there. The next set of uh, the same model has been uh, taken uh, to 10 villages where we uh, we validated it on a different scenario where we uh, did it on a local uh, village level entrepreneur. So the village level entrepreneur, this is also the 10 villages where we also have developed a community led network that is the community is owning the network in these villages. And uh, we have uh, identified a village level entrepreneur who invests an initial amount and buys the bandwidth from the local ISP. 
and uh, tries to get back the revenue from the villagers by selling the bandwidth in the village. And uh, after he gets back, uh, he uh, he ha he makes a profit in the after in the initial uh, amount that he has invested on. Um, he invests much more, and then the model keeps growing in itself. So this is the validation of the in the ten villages or the community-led network that Ramark has set up um, in uh, in in the in the ten villages. Now on the current usage scenario. We see that uh, the bandwidth, uh, so the the, uh, the village level entrepreneur makes a steady return on investment, and uh, this is uh, similar as uh, local ISP where um, he gets uh, uh, he or she gets a, um, a steady return on investment uh, uh, only of the of the capex and the opex uh, uh, that uh, the opex generation of the opex by the by selling the bandwidth in the villages and um, it, uh, it, it actually uh, stabilizes, uh, it, it, it slowly increases uh, from year one towards the end of year one and it, um, and it keeps increasing year after year. Now the five years predictive model for this, we see that uh, the bandwidth requirement, the, the required bandwidth and the available bandwidth goes uh, hand in hand with each other and uh, the the return on investment is uh, actually negative uh, in the uh, towards the uh, to, uh, for, f for the for the first two years after which it uh, makes a um, uh, steady growth so this is our model and uh, the model has been validated on ground as i have discussed i have told you earlier um, uh, i will be happy to take uh, questions and queries uh, on the and uh, and discuss further on this thank you Good morning, everyone. This is Shadwani Belur from Grammarg uh, Rural Bank. Well, that's a, a very interesting deployment that uses very innovative technologies in uh, not just last mile connectivity, but in backhaul as well. Uh, that's one fascinating uh, example. I'd like to now turn to Natalie Bois. Is it Bois? Bois, who's deploying networks in Namibia in a very innovative way. So as well, thank you very much, Natalie, for joining us. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Boyce and I'm from Namibia. Can, I, can everyone hear me? <laughs> okay, I don't have a presentation or anything. I made some notes. So I'll just read from my notes and then um, Mr. Paul Varney can probably assist me where he can. Okay. <laughs> okay, we use, we use, like, I work for an NGO, the Namibia Children's Health Project. We use the internet to send out information to mothers in rural areas. Um, from expecting mothers and mothers of newborns. This is to create awareness and guidance for the mothers to prevent child mortality in Namibia. There are over 50 unemployed youth in my country and the rate of underemployed is even higher. The digital revolution in Namibia has not yet reached Namibia. Why I say Namibia is digitally excluded is firstly, the internet is not accessible and worst of all, it is not affordable. And secondly, the internet is mainly afforded to the previously advantaged, so a struggled youth or a struggled mother cannot have, cannot easily access internet. And internet is a basic human right. So a majority of our youth do not have training in technical fields. And Namibia has deployed the biggest TV white space project um, test phase in the globe, and still Namibians cannot access, access, have access to the internet, isn't it Paul? Can you help me? <laughs> okay, okay, the digital economy would enable our youth to participate in digital economy as, and it would help as a great game changer and youth employment and empowerment. When SMEs try to engage the digital economy, it is almost impossible to secure funding it is easier for a farmer, a cattle herder, to secure funding than it is for an average Namibian. Traditional banks and SME banks see high risk in tech startups and rarely fund tech projects. Dig digital infrastructure does not exist in Namibia, forcing SMEs to migrate to cities like outside Namibia for internet. Um, yeah, please continue. No, please continue. Mr. Paul Varney will not take over. Just to add to what Natalie says is that there's a lot of challenges in Africa and we need the networks and we need the business models that enable those networks 
for our SMEs to thrive. And we, we have a massive uh, migration from the ur uh, rural areas to the urban areas. And the digital economy will enable uh, the Namibian youth uh, and the rural youth in particular to engage and uh, ba basically to, to become digital citizens. Well, thank you both Natalie and Paul. So if I understand what you're saying correctly, engaging the SMEs is a critical hybrid model for making the connectivity work in Namibia. Is that? Yeah, but, but it's about creating the drivers. So it, when, when you're moving, you want to get deal with that last mile, you've got to generate the demand. And right now that demand is moving to the urban areas because there isn't access in the rural areas, which means if you're an SME and you want to engage, and as Natalie said, the Mad Africa has one of the largest young population in the world, and it, it is growing. And if, if we don't create the opportunities, and there's no opportunities in the formal business, it has to be the informal sector. And the digital economy can help transform that informal sector and enable the youth to uh, gain employment uh, but we don't want that at the cost of migration just to the urban centers. So getting the SMEs engaged and giving them uh, access to, to connectivity at the rural area and the digital skills. It's, it's not just access, of course, it's creating those digital skills to enable SMEs to engage uh, on that platform. Uh, will transform Africa, it will in help on rural youth employment and it will solve a lot of the uh, uh, problems that, that we face right now. Or have you found any strategies for getting the digital training and other engagement needed to get the SMEs trained in place without having to move to the cities? Or are there other challenges that just you can't you face that you can't overcome? The, 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 there's, there's a growing uh, understanding of, of digital literacy and uh, it's, it's often driven by the NGO or the civil society sectors. Uh, ISOC in particular, it's, it's part of their core. Uh, so we're, we're, we're getting there, but in Namibia, it's quite a complex country. It's a massive con country, small population, large areas, uh, and you've got a lot of cultural differences. Language is a big different uh, uh, challenge. Uh, the majority of the population, they, they don't speak English, although English is the official language. So, you know, even having the right content and, and internet that uh, uh, the SMEs can actually interact with in, in a language that they understand, and they want to sell the goods and services in their language. So we've got to take what's in the real world and put it into the digital world for it really to succeed in, in, those, uh, in, 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 the, in the rural areas. And we're, we're, we're a long, long way off. There's a lot of problems and challenges that need to be resolved. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I would like to now turn the floor over to Al Alan Bailochan Tuladar at PicoSoft P Limited, who is doing uh, innovative deployments in Nepal to connect more people to the internet. Alan. Um, in terms of... Um Connecting in one of the most difficult terrains in the world where um, with the Himalayas as reaching the top of the, uh, uh, of the world, uh, difficult terrains, uh, the geography of people being sporadic and uh, pretty widespread. I think um, for us, fiber was not an option that could be affordable. So we had to look at technologies other than fiber and uh, uh, white space was, uh, uh, was better. In terms of every time we talked to the policymakers, uh, whenever we talked about TV white space, they thought we were uh, providing television. And because of that, uh, their um, uh, minds in terms of, uh, of uh, taxing was, was difficult. Uh, in Nepal, talking about taxes, in Nepal, um, we pay over 35% taxes on internet. 13% telecom service charge, 13% VAT, 2% royalty, 4% uh, universal uh, service fund. So when it gets aggregated, that's about 30, and uh, equal to um, uh, some of the industries like uh, gambling or uh, alcohol or uh, so, so some of the heavily taxed industries, internet is also in the same category in terms of being uh, taxed. So. Um, uh, we looked at, um, uh, and back home, I think majority of the infrastructure is also being funded with uh, development funds. Uh, so one possibility of uh, uh, investing into the infrastructure was, was being able to use development funds. But uh, major with most of our deployments are, are much smaller in terms of requirements of funds that it really does not attract the, uh, the World Banks and the uh, um, IMF or, or other uh, Asian Development Bank or other of the um, 
uh, private sector funding wings of these uh, uh, larger uh, funds that's available for for deployment of, of uh, heavy infrastructure, heavy uh, uh, capex involved uh, projects. Uh, on the other hand, is the um, uh, the possibilities of using, um, uh, if I may, uh, if uh, for lack of a better word, uh, kind of grant money or free money that does not need to be repaid back and it's not an investment or it's not a debt and uh, comes e easier is also with the uh, non-governmental sector. And again, um, uh, lots of players in that area. So in terms of looking at hybrid models of investments, development sector, non-government sector, the government also is um, uh, normally uh, with a lot of uh, fast changing in terms of the uh, government and also um, uh, with uh, potentially um, issues with uh, with kickbacks and corruption, we tend to stay away from from government funding as much as possible because it comes with a lot of other other strings attached to it. Uh, the other hybrid model definitely is uh, is trying to have the community pay for it, but uh, the community that we are addressing is uh, is. Uh, has um, accessibility, uh, affordability, and uh, and being able to um, uh, when they're looking at their uh, budgets, they have to decide on what is their priority. And internet is not in the highest of their priority. So, so having um, and I think uh, one of the uh, ways that uh, was talked earlier was to see if uh, the ways that how Facebook and Google and some of the other internet players have been able to fund their business to the consumer, it's free of cost, but there is a cost to the whole F uh, uh, whole business. So it has to be funded by other sources. And I think in this hybrid model, we we are we are kind of still struggling to find which would be the best model for us to look at. We are looking at now saying, do we go on to an aggressive pricing model where we sell our services into the city uh, and subsidize onto the, uh, onto the rural areas to be able to have a long-term sustainability? Um, the, with the donor funding, the difficult part is, is that it's a spurt funding, and then after that, it kind of uh, because uh, internet is not just uh, spurt funding because there is a major cost of the backhaul internet and the service and and support cost that needs to be sustained for a longer time so, and the spurt funding could could um, it, b it could become that that sense of a project that NGOs run where after the funding of the project the whole project dies down and and it doesn't have a long-term sustainable model we want it to be a su sustainable business so that uh, it should be able to uh, to continue even uh, if there's no external funding available. So we're still struggling with what would be the best model and maybe uh, from the room itself learn a bit in terms of um, how do we um, look at financing the growth and, and scale to a much larger extent uh, out of the um, 77 districts in Nepal, we are just active in two and uh, less than 150,000 population that we've been able to affect. And there's still 30 million people that, that we need to make sure that uh, uh, internet is accessible within the country. And I, I think the, the next big challenge that we are looking at is saying we've uh, started, we've um, uh, extended, how do we scale now to become a major player within the country? So I think the, the uh, model of hybrid financing is still something that we are we're still struggling with. Well, thank you very much, Alan. That's very inspirational. I'd like to turn the floor over to, Phil, uh, to Philip Zuzuleta, who is working on the Wireless Interactive Network, or WIN, in the Philippines. And from what little I know about my friends who've done work in the Philippines, with the difficult island architecture and the uncertain property rights, just getting access to rights of way can be an incredible challenge. I'm delighted to hear your story about your efforts in the Philippines. Sure. Thanks, Chris. So I'm Philip from the Philippines, easy to remember. I'm the founder and CEO of Wi-Fi Interactive Network. So I have some notes that I can read off and then we can just maybe go into a Q&A later. So in the three years that we've been uh, tackling this issue, we've actually gone through three iterations of our business model. So all three models have one thing in common. It's really a recognition that the audience and the user base we, we are addressing 
have very limited spending capacity. So in the Philippines, 96% of the users are on a prepaid pay-as-you-go model. So the average spend per month is roughly two US dollars for phone services. So that tells you a lot, right? So the first model that we launched uh, back in 2015 was what we call a sponsored Wi-Fi model. So the way we did that is we asked uh, consumer goods giants to fund the cost of providing internet access at community mom and pop stores. So in exchange, whenever the consumers purchase their specific brand, the consumer gets 30 minutes of free internet access for purchasing the sponsored brand. So we soon, in, soon encountered issues with that model because the community stores don't have POS systems to track if the brand was actually sold. So because we couldn't attribute the sale to the reward, uh, the brand couldn't continue investing in that particular model. So we moved on to the second model, which was a paid version. So the idea was to have the consumer pay two US cents per hour for paid access. So that's really affordable by many standards, right? The thing is we learned that if people were going to pay as little as two US cents per hour, they didn't really want to hang around the store. They wanted the service to actually be delivered to their homes, and that's really a tough market to serve, right? So now we're in version 3.0 of our business model, and this is where it gets interesting. So in the first two models, we were approaching the market with uh, if you build it, they will come approach, right? And we've completely reversed that because of the operational issues. We're now building it where they actually congregate. So we're now focused on a high traffic public areas like bus terminals, uh, frontline government offices, train stations, where there's a lot of, uh, you know, a crowd of users that we can easily address at any given time. So uh, we're launching this in Q1 next year. So what we're really doing is we're setting up the Wi-Fi hotspots this time, not necessarily as points of connectivity, but really as a venue to provide value-added services through a digital marketplace. So what we did this time is we developed an Android app so that when you connect to free Wi-Fi, you're offered a digital marketplace complete with a digital wallet so that people can transact, do financial transactions, even for the unbanked. So the value-added services include, as an example, number one, you can top up your digital wallet and purchase prepaid airtime load, which is very popular in the Philippines, and we can actually deliver these uh, products at a discount versus bricks and mortars. Second, right now, we're partnering with e-commerce-based companies that are actually dependent on internet connectivity to sell their own products and services. So as an example of this, this would be um, online discounted shopping sites. We're also having micro lending, so peer-to-peer -peer lending online can be facilitated through our free Wi-Fi hotspots. And a big one is actually online remittance. The ability to move funds, uh, cashing in into our digital, digital wallet with free connectivity, and then cashing out those funds with our partner sites from brick and mortar locations. So there are many more ad value added services that we can uh, include in this marketplace. Games, travel, music, ride hailing. These are all value added services that can pay for the cost of internet service, okay? So in closing, I just wanna say that in the three years we've been working on this very challenging issue, we have come to the conclusion that this is not really a technology problem. The tech exists in different flavors and there are many more to come. Our specific audience expects Wi-Fi to be free. As a private enterprise, our continuing work is to develop a win-win economic model where the consumers or the users get what they want, 
that at the same time our commercial partners are able to justify their continued participation and investment uh, in this approach. And I think that's the key to sustainability and we're hoping to report positive outcomes next year. Thank you. Well, thank you to Philip and thank you to all the speakers. I had hoped this to be an interactive session to get your input, but they only scheduled it for 30 minutes. And so I'm afraid at this point, unless there is a, a very pressing thing that someone would like to share or ask, uh, I'm inclined to adjourn it, uh, please. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Akua Walters. Um, I am from Jamaica, which um, shares a lot of the similar characterist characteristics of a lot of the markets um, that you guys operate in. Um, for instance, um, in, in, in your market, um, Jamaica, Jamaica has a duopoly um, of telecommunication giants. But um, for that last mile rural um, service, what, what ended up happening was um, there's, a, there's a company that basically pays homeowners to set up a Wi-Fi uh, hotspot at the back of their homes. And that really, that really helped to solve the, 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 the last mile issue for them because there was already connectivity in those areas. The issue was running the, running the cables or well, running the connection from uh, the main roads or wherever they, those, those um, points of connectivity were um, to the, the actual home. So what they ended up doing was just, um, was just basically broadcasting signals from those points. Um, into those communities um, as as a point. Um, uh, another one, um, another another way to, to look at your problem is is that of of uh, of supply of services, which you've already started down that road. Um, looking at ways to support um, small SMEs, um, or rather digitizing those services. A lot of those popular services that already exist within the market um, that a lot of the unbanked already use. Um, you already have the wallet. Um, what needs to, what needs to, well, or, or one suggestion would be, why not look at a way to not train those business, um, those business owners to code anything? Um, figure out how to connect them with digital service providers, people who can build those applications for them, and then basically have, have, a, have a per transaction, if you will, um, look at how um, at how they can, mo how you can monetize those networks. Because remember, um, treat Wi-Fi like a road, um, and just and just basically collect um, the, the collect on the traffic or collect on the transactions that are um, that are done there. Um, for for Namibia, um, what's what's well, interesting? We do need to wrap this up. So if you could keep it very short, we have another. Okay, I guess we can talk offline. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I don't, I don't need to be rude, but I don't no, want to course. keep them waiting as well. Of course. Well, that's, I think what you're thinking about in, in Jamaica is fascinating. I do encourage you to share your thoughts with Natalie and about what's going on in Namibia. Uh, but at this point, we've reached the end of our session. Um, I hope that this is the start of a conversation. This is a, a, we all have a shared commitment to the same goals. I hope that we will continue to meet today, tomorrow, and into future IGFs and other places in the future. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.